Good morning, everyone. I'm Megan Fox. I write with PJ Media. I'm still in my fluffy bathrobe because I haven't been up for very long. I'm still on my very first cup of coffee. And I found an article I cannot believe I missed that I need to read to you from Vulture magazine. And um, yeah, it's incredible. But before I get to that, I just wanted to do a quick channel announcement here that on Friday, I'm going to be premiering a video that is going to have a really fun, oh man, my allergies are bad. My eyes water really bad at this time of year and there's nothing I can do about it. So if you see me poking at my eyes, that's why. Um, Anyway, there's going to be a fun collaboration on Friday. I have some special appearing guests on a Friday premiere uh, video that I'm doing, and I'm going to do a live chat. So that's going to be happening on Friday. I, the time will be to be determined. I still haven't figured out what time on Friday. Let's just go with 7 p.m. How about 7 p.m.? No, that's too close to dinner time. Let's do 5 p.m like a happy hour, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so look forward to that on Friday. That'll be fun. All right, so getting to this article. Here we go. And don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps me with the algorithms if you like the video. Uh, share screen. Guys, you're not going to believe this. You are not going to believe this. You're going to get mad. You're going to get mad as I read this. Uh, just, <laughs> just so you know, this is going to make you angry because I'm not even finished reading it. I just started reading it and um, I'm already mad. Okay. So this was in Vulture by Jackson McHenry. And just like that, writers knew viewers would be Team Steve. This show has always been a bit of Michael Patrick King leans toward his Zoom camera and he tilts his head to the side. Did you see what they said? That's the DNA. King's referring both to Sex in the City and to And Just Like That. It's much debated, contested, memed, and overanalyzed sequel series, which he runs and which ends its first season with a series of events destined to incite more controversy. In the finale, Miranda, against the advice of her friends, gives up an... Okay, again, stop. Stop. Miranda, against the advice of her friends, gives up an internship. No, no, no. Which friend told her not to do this? Did any of her friends tell her not to do this? No, they did not, which is one of the major problems we've had with this show. Am I right? That no one bothered to tell Miranda that she has lost her goddamn mind? No one. So that's your first problem, Michael Patrick King. No one told her not to. Oh, in fact, in this scene in the bathroom, which they're picturing here, Carrie doesn't tell her not to do it. All she does is question why she wants to leave her internship, but then she backs off immediately because Miranda screams at her. All right, where was I? I'm losing my place. I'm losing my place. Try, see, I'm already getting hot under the collar and we're not even, I haven't even got to the first paragraph yet. I, I'm only in like the third sentence. <laughs> um... In the finale, Miranda, against the advice of her friends, gives up an internship to head to California after her love interest, Jay Diaz, tells her they're moving, uh, Che is moving across the country. She also dyes her hair, hair red. Charlotte takes over her kids' they mitzvah after Rock reveals she's neither prepared nor interested in going ahead with it. Carrie flies off to Paris to toss Big's ashes into the Seine and connects with Samantha via text message and it's implied off screen before moving on with the producer of her new podcast, which is called, of course, Sex in the City. All of this on top of a season that introduced a bevy of new characters saw Miranda intervene in a Chucky attack on the subway and had carry both pee into a cup while Miranda got fingered in the next room and projectile vomit on a date. It's a lot to process, both for the show's audience and the writers once the audience started reacting to the series. They love the characters, King said, of And Just Like That's viewers. And that is a blurse, a blessing and a curse. Oh, God, he's so full of himself. A blurse? Really, Michael Patrick King? A blurse? So they know that we love these characters. And he doesn't care. He doesn't care. 
Moving on, in order to understand how And Just Like That came together, Vulture spoke with some of its writers. King, executive producers Elisa Zaritsky and Julie Rottenberg, who returned to the show from the original series, and newcomers Rachna Fruchbaum, co-executive producer, and Samantha Irby, co-producer. The show's sixth writer, Kelly Goff, was not available for an interview. <laughs> she knows better. She's hiding. This article, by the way, came out on February 3rd, the same day uh, that the episode 10 aired. They talked about how and why they wrote some of the key moments of the season, as well as the reactions they expected and didn't expect to provoke. When the writers decided to have Miranda explore a divorce from Steve, for instance, King told them all to put on their seatbelts and brace for a bumpy road. To that, he said, in writing something, if it's not dangerous, fast, and a little bit treacherous, where are you driving to? Oh, God. This is that. All right, this is me talking for a minute. This is that um, that theory that everything that that you must ruin something. You know, you must ruin it in order to make it valuable. And I don't, I don't agree. This was a comedy. It was not a tragedy. It was not a drama. It never was. And if my eyes don't stop watering, I swear to God, I'm going to scratch them out. This is just anybody suffering with allergies knows. I've already taken two pills this morning and it's not helping at all. This is why I can't wear eye makeup. Maybe my, um, my new friend's uh, Kate, the great beauty and, um, and, uh, the other cat's eye beauty would, would give me some advice on how the heck to stop to wear eye makeup when you have, uh, allergic eyes. I don't think it works. All right. Big dies via exercise bike. And in just like that's first episode, Carrie's husband, big dies of a heart attack after riding his Peloton, something King had imagined as a key aspect of the series from the jump. Michael Patrick King says, The really clear pitch is Carrie Bradshaw is single again at 55. Big had to die. Otherwise, there would be no reason to come back. What? I just can't with him. The Peloton bike was because I wanted to show that at 55 or 65, Carrie and Big are current. Post-pandemic, everybody was exercising in their houses. He's not an old guy like you kids today on your Pelotons. He's active. His heart's pumping. It's a damaged heart, but it's pumping. People came into the show going, oh, they're old. No, that's, oh, uh, this is not what we came into the show thinking. Oh, they're old. That's what you did to them. That's what you showed us. You, you went out of your way, MPK, to make them old as fuck. And they're not, they weren't old. They're not old. Our lives are not over because we're middle-aged. <laughs> oh, Jesus. All right. Oh, they're old. And I wanted to be like, are they? What's old now? That's all up for debate. No, you made them old AF. Old AF, Michael Pe That was all you, MPK. All right. Samantha Irby says... In my interview for the show, I was like, Big has to die, right? What are they going to do? I guess we could spend 10 episodes learning all the context for Big we didn't get in the original series. But then Michael was like, he's going to die. And I was like, oh, great. Perfect. Don't you love the way these people um, just throw around our favorite characters like it's nothing, like they're disposable tissue paper? Great. He's got, he's got to die. Oh, God. I can't. And by the way, the reason why they couldn't spend 10 episodes learning all the context for Big We Didn't Get is because they don't have the talent to do it. They can't even write dialogue for a date scene. So do you think that they could do anything uh, worthwhile with Big's character? I, get, I should be glad they killed him off. They killed him off before they could destroy him too. At least Big got to die himself. He was Big till the end. Ugh, I can't. MPK says, um, you guys are going to love this. The death in the shower felt like poetry on the page. It was like, and then she lifts up his body and the water cascades down the back of her. When we filmed it, it was brutal. Trying to create death in a shower with two bodies getting wet, it was harder to film than to write. This guy is so full of himself and his ideas. Like, uh, brutal. Brutal is a good word to describe what that was, MPK. Thanks for that. Samantha lives via text message. When the new series 
starts, we learn that Samantha and Carrie are estranged because Samantha moved to London after Carrie dropped her as a publicist, a cover for Kim Cattrall's decision to not return to the series. Carrie texts Samantha over the course of the show. And in the finale, it's implied that they reunite off screen while Carrie is in Paris to scatter Big's ashes. King has said he does not expect Cattrall to ever appear in the new series. MPK says, Carrie ends the season taking care of business, letting go of the idea of what was and claiming what's important, which is Samantha. She's right there. There's only the channel, the channel between them. Then Franklin, Carrie's podcast pro producer, whom she kisses in the finale's last moments, represents the future. Connecting with Samantha was the present. Letting go of Big was the past, and Franklin is the future. Well, by the way, Paris and London are over 200 miles apart. Pretending like it's a ferry ride across the channel or a tunnel ride through the channel or whatever the hell he's talking about. It's an awful long time. And a lot of people notice that. Like, 200 miles is not a short trip. Okay? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Julie Rottenberg says, because Carrie has this history with Samantha, we wanted to honor that. The worst thing that could happen to Carrie already did. Big died. So letting Big go is liberating for Carrie. She's going to give it one more try to make this bold invitation and to have Samantha say, yes, we loved that reward. Yeah, but she's letting Big go over a bridge into a dirty river without any of his family present. Did she even notify them? And she was shaking that thing like, like a canister vacuum over. <laughs> I can't even think about it without laughing. Oh, God. Watch that back, you guys, because that physical comedy of her shaking the ashes out of her Judith Lieber bag into that dirty river. Oh, it was the best moment in the show. The best moment of the whole series. It made me laugh so hard. Oh, God. Oh, and they didn't mean to make me laugh, but that was what was so funny about it. Okay, you're really going to hate this part. This is the part where you get mad. Are you ready? Are you ready to get mad? You might want to refill your coffee and make it extra strong because this part is really going to piss you off. <laughs> Introducing Jay Diaz. Miranda is hiding her drinking problem from her friends at the beginning of the season, but she abruptly gives up after becoming obsessed with Carrie's boss, the non-binary diva comedian slash podcast host played by Sada Ramirez. In episode five, Tragically Hip, credited to Irby, Che fingers Miranda while Carrie, recovering from hip surgery in the next room, is forced to pee in a jar. I'm sorry, just thinking about that scene makes me want to erp because Miranda isn't paying attention to her. Samantha Irby says, I can't even get through this. I was really lobbying for Che to have some fuckboy energy. I have a wife. I get it. Nobody wants to be the magical gay, the person who's swept in and has no flaws. With Che, Michael used to do stand-up, and I have never done... Who's Michael? I don't know who she's talking about, Michael. Michael Patrick King? I don't think he ever did stand-up, so I don't know. Maybe he did. With Che, Michael used to do stand-up, and I've never done stand-up, but I have a lot of friends who are stand-ups, and we thought that their their comedy, Che's comedy, could be a light roast of modern stand-up, a little Hannah Gadsby mixed with annoying front-facing video comics, all the ways the comedy is happening now. Okay, stop. FYI, <laughs> Samantha Irby is not a comedian. She does not do stand-up. She has friends who do stand-up, and she thinks that qualifies her to write a stand-up routine. Are you freaking kidding me? Um, yeah, so she's qualified to write stand-up. Not. All right, I'm continuing on. I do think one of the least charitable takes is that we're not in on some of the jokes the internet is making. Comedy concert, what Miranda calls Chase performance, is an intentional joke because that's what your mom would call it. Um, okay, Samantha, if you have to explain your jokes, it's not funny. It's not, it wasn't a good joke. 
uh, because that's what your mom would call it. I think it's interesting, too, to have somebody who's non-binary doing the things an asshole man would do. I know the Internet is like, fuck J. Diaz. But that's also kind of the point. See, I'm not sure I buy this. I think they had an entire season to hear the feedback from the fans and they're taking our feedback and they're saying, we always meant to do that. We always meant for you to hate Shay. Did they though? Did they? I don't really believe them. I don't think they meant to have us uh, hate Shay. In fact, why would they make Miranda run off with Shay if we weren't supposed to like the character? I think if they really had wanted us to dislike her, Che, then they would have um, had Che cheating on Miranda, like we all said she should have in Cleveland. That would have been one way to show the audience that you knew Che was a jerk, but you they didn't. They didn't. They really thought we were going to love this character. All right. MPK says, the thing we understood was that Miranda is ramrod disciplined when she wants to be. So the easiest patch on her drinking was just hard ass stopping. But then she goes to get another addiction, which is that she's madly preoccupied with Che. It certainly takes the edge off boredom. All right. So now MPK is saying that they know that they are making Miranda this addictive personality and that the Che thing is just another addiction. But if that's the truth, I mean, they could have written that story and actually been a lot more clear about it. No one ever confronts Miranda. Miranda doesn't ever, the, her friends never give her an intervention in 10 episodes? In 10 episodes? That's just ridiculous. Rajna Frutchbaum, Miranda is making choices to be Miranda, and Che is a conduit to that. And making Che not perfect highlights that. Che is not the perfect solution, but the representation is that Miranda is embracing chaotic change. It's about a woman who is very structured and dogmatic, willing to do something very unknown. Miranda, I, I don't know. I don't think she's making choices to be Miranda. She's making choices to be somebody we don't recognize. I mean... All right. Samantha says, I wanted Miranda to have an experience. Oh, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. I wanted Miranda to have an experience where she is submissive that you would come away from as a viewer being like, I understand why she's hooked on this person <laughs> in the script because Che is like a walking Twitter thread. I wrote that Che is always asking for consent. And then I wrote, did, wait, you guys, did you ever hear Che asking for consent? I guess when she was like, can I shotgun you or whatever? Whatever. And then I wrote that Miranda has a vibrant orgasm. I didn't elaborate. And when I first saw the episode, Cynthia was like barking or something. It was unbelievable. I was glad it was a little bit like, bitch, shut up. I loved that scene and that fight. The idea that you have incredible sex that made you question your sexuality and then you immediately have to come down off that cloud and be like, I just crossed a terrible friendship line. When SJ spit the straw out, I was like, God damn, give her an Emmy. These people are so in love with their own writing. So in love with their own writing. Just crazy. Ugh. The drive-by facelift. In episode six, Diwali credited by, to Frookbaum, Carrie goes with Anthony to a plastic surgeon played by the unnervingly smooth Jonathan Groff. The doctor suggests she get work done instead. Ruch, Ra, Rachna says, Michael came in with the idea that we weren't going to shy away from stuff that might make people outraged or uncomfortable. The idea of aging in faces is very real, and we saw it in a lot of the public commentary about the actress's looks that I thought was very unkind. Michael had always wanted to tackle the topic and came up with this idea of a drive-by facelift where it happens to you and you weren't asking for it. MPK says, anybody who's taken a bad selfie has thought, do I need a little, it's just what people think about. Like when they were 35 in other series, were they wondering, do I need to have a plus one to go somewhere? I don't know, MPK. I don't think normal people sit around thinking about whether they need plastic surgery or fillers. For one, most people could never afford that kind of luxury. And for two, you know, especially people who are parents trying to give their kids, you know, a good example there's nothing wrong with aging and 
you know, I, I don't have that strong opinions on plastic surgery. If you want to do it, do it. But I, I personally think this idea of what they did to her in the show with talking about how hollowed, hollowed out her face is, I think they were meaner to Sarah Jessica Parker than anybody was, than any of the fans were. And the only people I heard talking about talking about the looks of the actresses were of us asking what the hell happened to Kristen Davis's mouth. Because whatever she did there is not good plastic surgery. It's bad plastic surgery. And that's one of the reasons why I think people should stay away from it. Because it doesn't always go well. And most of the time, you just start looking crazy. So uh, people were saying, what the hell happened to Kristen Davis? And how come she didn't just age normally as such a beautiful woman? Why did she do the thing to her mouth that made her look like Janice the Muppet from The Muppet Show? What? What? And that's the only thing that we asked. <laughs> Nobody said anything about them looking bad or old. That's what you did, MPK. You did that. Mm. Uh, JR. Oh, that would be Rottenberg. JR. Elisa and I are 51, and we wanted the women to talk about the things we talk about. We were excited to put that plastic surgery scene out there. Elisa Zaritsky said, in the old series, the taboo thing was that they were talking about sex in a frank way. For this series, I felt like, what if they talked honestly about aging? As women were told not to talk about it very much. Who, who tells you that, Elisa? Who tells you you can't talk about aging? What is this nonsense? As women were told not to talk about it very much? Who? Nobody told me that. Was I absent the day of the uh, Zoom meeting for all women where we were told what we can and cannot talk about? I guess I must have missed that. She says, we were excited to proudly embrace the aging process. All right, I'm going to make this into two parts because my kid needs me. So part two coming soon.